Good morning and welcome to Charleswood Community Church Online. We are so glad that you've chosen to be with us once again. We're almost getting used to recording like this week by week and, and uh, getting it ready for your viewing and participation on Sunday mornings, but I hope you're not getting too used to it. You know, if you're really still feeling that that missing piece, if the worship isn't quite the same as being in the building, if listening to the sermon online isn't quite the same, that is good. That is the idea. We are not meant to celebrate Jesus on Sundays alone in our own homes. And we look forward to and we anticipate the day when we can meet again. Until then, we've begun a new feature um, as part of our Sunday morning services where we get to take a peek into the lives of some of our church family members um, and see how they're managing during this time of COVID-19. And so today, we're gonna take a look and see what Wendy and Jonas Dobis have been up to. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Dobis residence. I'm Jonas, and this beautiful lady over here is my wife, Wendy. Gavin asked for volunteers to do some videos of uh, life during COVID-19, so we uh, volunteered. And we're starting our day here sitting at our table with some wonderful breakfast. And uh, since we're retired, we, we don't have to rush into anything. We can enjoy just sitting here and talking and, and looking out the window at the beautiful sunny morning. And after breakfast, I get up and find the dog who's eating her breakfast right now right beside me. You can't see her and uh, then I take her for a nice 30 minute walk. So Jonas, how has our life changed since the pandemic? Well, since we're retired, it hasn't changed really that much other than the, the uh, just that we can't go interact with people. Uh, that's the only thing that's changed. As, as far as routine, while well, the shopping has changed, of course, don't go as often and it's not the same, but as far as around here, it's not all that much different. Well, I think sometimes we can um, take things a little slower than we used to. We don't get up to have to go out somewhere for nine o'clock, so Jonas can walk the dog and then we can um, spend time doing a devotional together and praying together and doing our own quiet time. And very often that takes the whole morning, which is just fine. And then what else do we do during the day? Well, we do our chores. Uh, we both like to exercise. Uh, Wendy was telling me just the other day how she hasn't felt this fit in a long time because she has lots of time to exercise. So we each do our own things. I like to go for jogs every now a couple times a week and then we have an exercise room in our basement. So we spend time doing that uh, in addition to other chores. Uh, and also we both like to cook. Um, that hasn't really changed much either. Uh, right behind me there's a crock pot with a nice roast in it that we're going to have for supper. So and, uh, uh, I, I enjoy having lots of time to do my, my um, hobbies. Quilting, reading, and uh, we do watch Netflix a bit. So we do have a um, much leisurely pace, but by far the most um, interesting and fun thing we do every single day is get outside and walk the dog. So here we are, me and, uh, and the dog, Kona. I've nicknamed her uh, Kona 19 for this uh, pandemic. Just, and she likes it. She still responds to that name. But here we are on the Hart Trail, doing what uh, Kona and I both love to do every day, is come for a walk. We just get to enjoy just the peacefulness of the trail here. It, it feels like I'm out camping on this path, the Hart Trail, which used to be an old railway bed. And I can hear the birds singing, the sun is up, and uh, the snow is gone. It just really lifts my spirits to, to be out here, and I, I spend time here just thinking about uh, God's creation, and I spend time talking to him here too. I just can't help myself just so beautiful. So this is a highlight 
of every single day and Kona and I do this three times a day. And I really enjoy seeing spring come. The um, sun is shining, the snow has melted, the birds are back and it's normal. Around us everything is abnormal. But when I get on the trail, it's normal. And it feels like I'm so close to God and I can cry out to him, I can talk to him. And so this is my favorite time of the day too. Thanks Jonas and Wendy. Maybe we'll see you on the heart trail sometime. As we begin our time of worship together, let me read to you from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And it's so good to gather together and to worship the Lord and sing praises to his name. And in a little while after this sermon, we're going to celebrate communion together. And again, it's not the way we normally would do it, and it's not the way we would prefer to do it. But we encourage you and invite you to participate all the same. You can pause the video at any time and go get some crackers and some bread or some juice or water, whatever, um, to... Take a moment and remember the sacrifice of Jesus and the unending love of God. Ready? Two, three, four. Waters deep. 
father for my good. Yes, you make all things work together for my good. Yes, you make all things work together for my Verses 9 and 10 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Oh my God. 
like snow the sun forbear to shine Hey folks, glad to be with you again. How are you doing? Here we are. We've made it into May and a new chapter of this COVID-19 adventure beckons us. And so things are beginning to open up, we hope. And so we'll see how that goes. So post Easter, we've been doing this sermon series called Life Interrupted. And I think it's quite appropriate because all our lives right now are a series of challenges and interruptions and left turns as we try to navigate this, this whole COVID-19 adventure. And we're looking at the life of Abraham and the lessons from, from his life that we can apply to us as well. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 14 and we're going to look at kind of a specific interruption this week. And that's the physical danger or, or conflict, real times of trouble and, and distress. And some of us certainly know what that is. And I was thinking about this just in terms of, uh, of change and in the whole context of, of what we're going through. And experiencing change in a fallen world means inevitable disruption. Inevitable disruption. And I'm not using the word disruption in the, in the sense that, you know, we hear it today in, in business. Uh, innovation is almost a synonym for that. What I mean to say is disruption in the classic sense of the word. In the 1400s, the word disruption was a medical term. It literally meant to lacerate or to tear the flesh. It means to split apart. It was not a good word. You did not want to be disrupted. And I'm thinking about disruption in those kinds of terms. Worlds being split apart. Things being torn apart. And folks, we do live in a fallen world, don't we? And the Bible tells us this, and our experience confirms that too. Things don't work the way they're supposed to. And evil in God's sovereignty is allowed to work itself out. And people have the capacity uh, and the opportunity and sadly the desire to do terrible things to each other. And we were reminded of this a couple of weeks ago uh, when we heard about this mass shooting, uh, April 18th and 19th in Nova Scotia. 23 people, including the shooter, were killed. And just a, it's a bizarre story. The shooter was driving around in a replica of RCMP vehicle. He had a uniform on. And this, this whole uh, scenario unfolded over hours, about 13 hours, about 155 kilometers. The, it was all spread out. And the strangest thing to me was the, the shooter shot people that he knew 
and he didn't know. And this sort of the, it would, the, the target and the randomness all together, it was just a real horrifying thing. I was speaking to a colleague of mine, a pastor in Halifax, and he said Halifax is such a small community, or, and Nova Scotia is a small community, that, that even people in, in Halifax, the big city, knew of, of those people in, in central Nova Scotia. And they were indirectly or, or connected somehow to some of these victims, and just the whole community was, was grieving. So the difficulties that, that we have in trying to conduct our lives can you imagine trying to grieve and make sense of all this, this uh, situation? My friend said it was, it was like watching a bad episode on Netflix and not being able to turn the channel. So very, very strange. But we live in a fallen world and it means inevitably that there will be times of disruption. And not disruption in terms of, oh, I can't go to the store, I can't go shopping, but real disruption when our lives just are split apart, when, when our lives just uh, are shattered and the world doesn't make sense anymore. And Abraham is a guy who knows exactly what that's all about. And maybe he, he's had days and weeks and maybe even months of, of when things don't happen, but his story as recorded in Genesis uh, we get the highlights and we get a lot of disruption. And Abraham's life, as recorded in the Bible, is one series of left turns and challenges and disruptions, one after the other. Abraham experiences constant change. And the text we're looking at today, Genesis 14, Walter Brueggemann, the great Old Testament scholar, calls this the, the strangest chapter in Genesis, Genesis 14. I don't know, we're going to take a look at it, and I'm not sure if it's that. My vote is for Genesis 6. I think that's the, the weirdest chapter in Genesis, but maybe, maybe you'll want to take a look at Genesis 6 and see what you think and, and message me and, and give me your nomination for strangest uh, chapter. But regardless, Brueggemann is right. There are some, a lot of odd things going on in, in Genesis 14. There's, there's rebellion. There's political intrigue, there's war, there's this hostage res rescue, plus one of the most mysterious characters in the Bible. He only appears in Genesis 14 and then in Psalm 110, and then he's a major character in the New Testament, Melchizedek. And so it, it is a strange chapter. And what is it all about? Well, it is about change in the middle of conflict. And so what do we need to remember in times of disruption? My kids, when they were growing up, loved this, this uh, book series called A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. And I think there was 13 books in all, and there was a movie, there's a Netflix series, and it's quite a popular series. I think it sold over 60 million books. It's been translated into over 40 languages. 40 different languages, so maybe you've seen it or heard of it, maybe your kids have read it. Um, but that kind of reminds me of, of Abraham's life, a series of unfortunate events. And so what does this series in Genesis 14, what is this series of unfortunate events, what does this teach us about handling danger and conflict and yes, times of great disruption? Well, in verses 11 to 14, we see right away that there's this political drama going on. There's, there's this almost civil war going on. And it's four big kings and five small kings. And if Sesame Street has taught us anything, it's big beats small every day of the week. And that's what happens. The four big kings destroy the five small kings. And so what happens? Well, the text tells us. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. So they seized all the goods. And this is what happens in warfare in, in the ancient Near East, right? It's, it's the might makes right, and the only way that you hang on to your stuff is that you are either allied with somebody who's big and mean, or you're big and mean yourself. There's no legal recourse, there's no uh, justice system, there's no police force, it's just might makes right. These four big kings come in and they just take everything and 
there they have it. And so the, the story of Lot is interesting, isn't it? The, when last week we saw he chose the whole well-watered plain, this fat pasture, and he says, I'm going to take this whole thing, and he goes and lives near the city of Sodom. And what do we find? Well, now he's living in the city of Sodom, and he gets caught up. And so this is the great lie of compromise. And you've told yourself this, I've told myself this, you know, this is the human condition, right? Oh, I'll just get just close enough to enjoy the benefits of sin without really get, getting my hands dirty. Well, you know, compromise, we get sucked in, and sure enough, we find ourselves living right smack dab in the middle of it. And that's what happened to Sodom, or that's what happened in Sodom with, with Lot as well. And this is why you don't, uh, this is, you know, the old proverb, you know, bad company collect, uh, corrupts good morals, right? And this is why we tell our kids, this is why we don't hang around people who are doing bad things because inevitably you will get sucked up into it and, and you'll get, even if it's just indirectly, you'll get associated with this somehow. And sure enough, Abram, Abram's nephew gets caught up in all this and he gets uh, carried off. Uh, Abram is living... Uh, you the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, and, and all these other guys who were allied with Abram. So Abram is, is held up here as, as kind of a paragon of wisdom. His allies are faithful. His allies are wisely chosen, and they're good supporters. Not only that, but Abram has, uh, when he hears that his relative has been taken captive, he calls out his trained men that are born in his household to have a loyalty to him and off they go as far as Dan. So here's Abram. Uh, he's prudent, he's equipped, and he's ready to go. So that brings us to our, our first point. Beyond alliances, we need a champion who's committed to us. And just think about your life for a second. When trouble comes, your car breaks down in the middle of nowhere, when maybe your shed burns down, maybe you lose your job, when real trouble happens when you get that diagnosis when real disruption occurs who's got your back who's who will be your helper in times of real trouble so I just want to, if you have your bibles just look at, at uh, genesis 14 verse 10 and here's the the four big kings and the five small kings and, and the fight and verse 10 sort of grabs my attention here now the valley of sedum was full of tar pits and when the kings of sodom and gomorrah, and gomorrah fled some of the men fell into them and the rest fled to the hills some of these guys fell into tar pits and what did their allies do see you later off they went to the hill. They, they literally ran for the hills and they left them there to die or to be killed or captured. Those are the kind of allies we don't need, right? How about this in, in uh, verse 16, just a couple of pages over, or a page over. And what does Abram do? Uh, Abram pursues uh, these kidnappers. He recovers all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. Abram rescues everything and everybody. He is a good ally to have, unlike the faithless ones that we read earlier. Allies are all good and well, but we need somebody who's personally committed to us and will go above and beyond, and even in times of danger, will be committed to us. The picture you're seeing on your screen there is from an uh, incident that occurred in February of 2018 one of the horrifying uh, recurring themes in American culture is school shootings. And in Parkland, Florida, 17 people were killed, 17 people, uh, students were wounded by a 19-year-old gunman. And what was unusual about this, aside from the, the, the high body count, was this was the first time that an armed deputy outside the school was actually charged legally with failing to protect a student. He had arrived on the scene, he heard gunshots, and it was a full uh, 10 minutes before he radioed in for help. He was outside, he wasn't, he was just standing there, and I don't, the reports are either he froze or he was scared or he just, he didn't understand what to do, but he just stood there while uh, gunshots were going on and there was, the shootings were going on in the school. He was 
uh, he's facing 11 charges, neglect of a child, perjury, he lied about it, and culpable negligence. And the court said that this man had failed in his job as a police officer. And there was this, this sense of betrayal too. And we can understand that in, in COVID-19 days. I, I, I look at social media and I, I'm just talking with somebody uh, who is blaming our government or blaming the Chinese government or blaming health officials. And, and in times of disruption, we, we tend to look around and we try to figure out who's to blame. We need a scapegoat, don't we? We want to blame somebody. Bad, something bad happened and so somebody's to blame. Somebody should pay for this. And often that's the case. There's been negligence or been incompetence and, and something's broken down and, and somebody does need to call to be called into account. But the truth of the matter is, folks, and, and we know this from our own experience, is when all is said and done, humans fail each other, don't we? And maybe maybe you've been the one to, to fail people. And maybe you've you've been in a situation like that where somebody counted on you or relied upon you and you didn't come through or you you were like one of those allies who, who saved your own skin and ran to the hills or you just froze. But hum, human people and human institutions will fail us because we live in a fallen world. We live in a broken world and things don't work and people don't work the way they're supposed to do. And so friends, we need a supernatural security at the end of the day. It's not enough to rely on people or rely on ourselves or human institutions because those will fail. Those have to fail. We need supernatural security. We need a champion who's committed to us and not whose job it is and who will only go so far, but somebody who will be committed to the death, beyond death, to rescue us. Well, verses, uh, Genesis 14 continues, and Abram uh, accomplishes the rescue, and then as he's coming back with, with all the, the people and, the, and the, the possessions, he's met by this mysterious figure, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is the king of Salem, and he brought out bread and wine, and he was not just a king, but he was a priest of God Most High. And this name, Melchizedek, is, is a very interesting name. It means literally king of righteousness. And so his name means king of righteousness, and he's also the king of Salem. And Salem in, in Hebrew means king of, it means peace. So he's the king of righteousness, king of peace, and he's also a high priest. So he's this, this real interesting figure. And he is... You can see in the blue text there, this, this phrase, God Most High, in, in the Hebrew, it's El Elyon. It simply means uh, the Creator God. Or as we might say in Manitoba, uh, with, in, with our indigenous people, the Great Spirit, right? The Manitou. Uh, so he is the, the priest of, of the, the Canaanite, the, the high Canaanite deity, the Most High uh, Creator God, Creator of heaven and earth. And Abram, interestingly, says to him, with raised hand I have sworn an oath to, not Elion, but to Yahweh, to Yahweh, who is the Creator God. And so here is Abram just providing that li this last little bit of knowledge. You think that you know who the Creator is, this great spirit, but, but I know him by name, and his name is Yahweh. And in that culture that was tremendously significant because to know somebody, you needed to know their name. And if you knew their name, you had a relationship with them. If you didn't know their name, you, they were some far off person or deity or place and, and you didn't have any kind of connection to them. But if you knew their name, you had a relationship with them. And, and here's Abram saying, I know this God. This is, this is my God and I'm telling you, this is Yahweh. And so I have sworn an oath to him. So that brings us to our second point. In times of trouble and disruption, people cry out to God, the God that, pe that Christians know by name. And this is a very interesting passage for theologians. They, they look at it and say, well, this is an example of, of general versus specific revelation. And in other words, 
everybody, your friends, your family, your neighbors, your, your uh, friends at work, uh, everybody knows something about God. That's called general revelation. We know it from creation. We know it from our conscience. We know it from logic and reasoning. Uh, this is a wonderful, intricate world. It must have come from someplace. We know it from culture and history and tradition. People uh, in, in Canada today uh, have this kind of fuzzy ideas about God, but, but they, they have a, a little bit of inkling. Wow, well, I, I, I grew up in Sunday school. I don't go there anymore, but I, I heard about this God, and I, I think he's, he's powerful, and, and, he, and he wants what's best for me. And lots of Canadians, most Canadians, have a very fuzzy idea of of the Creator God, the Great Spirit, the, the God Most High, and they, they have that idea. But Christians have a very specific revelation. This God is, is God Almighty, is, is the God of the Bible, is the Father of, of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the big why of evangelism, of being and bearing the good news of Jesus is simply telling people and pointing to people to Jesus. Oh, it's, it's not just a, the Creator, the Great Spirit, Manitou, uh, the big guy in the sky, whatever it is that your friends and neighbors have this fuzzy idea about. We say, oh yeah, it's, it's God. I know Him. I know Him by name. And our big job, our mission, is to point people to Jesus and introduce them to Jesus. And I think in times of conflict and disruption, people cry out to, to God, don't they? And I, in times of great stress and great joy and, and disruption, uh, I often hear the name of God used. And sometimes it's, it's used as a curse, uh, but I think a lot of times it, it's a heart cry and people just, when they hear something awful, they say, oh my God, and is it a curse or, or, or is, it, is it just a cry of, of, of a, a created being crying out, this doesn't make sense, please bring justice, please bring healing, please, please help me in this situation. I think uh, it often operates that way. And so who's going to help them? Who's going to point them to, to the, the, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible who, who wants a relationship and who can help? These COVID-19 days are a tremendous opportunity for believers, aren't they? For us to point to, it's, it's Jesus. That's, that's the one who can help, not, not some mysterious force, not some, some spirit in the sky, some impersonal deity, but, but Jesus wants to help. Jesus knows what it's like. Last week I talked to you about, uh, in 1815, Mount Tambora in, in Indonesia exploded 100 times more powerful than the Mount St. Helens explosion in 1980. But in that, in that 1850 explosion, the following year was, was referred to as the year of no summer. And there was just crop failures and, and atmospheric disturbances and climate change all throughout Europe and, the, and on the eastern seaboard in North America. And it caused all kinds of great cultural uh, 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 things to happen. Uh, there was, there was uh, emigration and, and different things. Did you know that there was also this, a tremendous upswell of religious revival? Uh, in fact, the, the, uh, they call it the Second Great Awakening occurred. And this, this was one of the things, this, the, the year of no summer, it was one of the things that that, that really spurred a lot of missionary work. The first great awakening was all about churches sort of becoming alive, but it was more about, it was more inward. The second great awakening that happened around 1816 and that sent out missionaries was all about outward focus. And missionary societies were formed and pe as people were moving across the continent, moving across the, and there was great, great migration and great uncertainty and great disruption, the churches in, in Europe and, and uh, North America and around the world said, people need Jesus. They need to know that, that God is there to help them. And so there was the huge boom of mission activity and a huge boom in culture as well. So lots of social justice uh, things going on. There was, this was a big 
thing for emancipation and, and freeing slavery, it was prohibition, it was giving women the vote, it was all kinds of addressing social evils. During that time, it was a tremendous opportunity. People's lives were cracked open and, and, and the disruption had occurred and the churches said, listen, Jesus is the answer. And we know him and, and we could introduce him and the, the churches really stood in the gap during the, great sec, the second great awakening. And I hope that, that that opportunity is there for the church in Canada during COVID-19 as well, during these days right now and in, in the, the weeks and months to come that the church will step forward and say, it's not just a, an impersonal force who, who may or may not be there for you. It's Jesus and he is the answer. Well, flipping over to Hebrews, and I, I mentioned that, uh, so just in a couple of places in the Old Testament, he's a really minor character and kind of a mysterious character, but Hebrews picks him up and, and he's a major figure in the book of Hebrews, chapters five, six, and seven. Melchizedek is this, this major figure as, as the writer of Hebrews holds him up and says, he's, he's the, the forerunner of, of Jesus. And so here's Hebrews five, verses seven to 10. And the description here of, of Jesus as our, as our great high priest. And so here it is. Uh, Jesus uh, was heard uh, offering up prayers and petitions to his Father because of his reverent submission. He learned obedience from what he suffered and once made perfect, he became the source of salvation. So here's this, this really meaty theology about Jesus as our great high priest, as our go-between, between between the Father and uh, and just really interesting here. And so Jesus learns, uh, learns obedience uh, through what he suffered. And that word suffer there just means experience from sense and feeling. Jesus wasn't this impersonal deity that was just out there. He was, he was flesh. He was, he was a man. He, and he experienced suffering. He went through it for 32, 33 years. And once made perfect, uh, once he reached the end stage, once he completed his task, once he finished the job, he was the source of salvation to all who obey him. The ones, and in the pink text there, I, I like that, he was designated by God, he was declared by God, he was pointed to, and the Father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Look what he has done. He, I will heap triumph and glory upon him. Look what he has accomplished. He is now the one who was able to bring salvation. In the order of Melchizedek, what does that mean? And I, I like this little print here. This is a print from the Middle Ages here. About the, Here's a picture of Melchizedek, the, the high priest, offering the, the bread and wine to, to Abram on the way back from the, the combat rescue mission. And what's Hebrews saying? Hebrews is saying that, that Jesus uh, is, is this this fulfillment of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is, is one of the characters in the Old Testament that's pointing forward to Jesus. And so Melchizedek is, we, we call it a type. He's, he's a type, he's a, he's a forerunner, a foreshadowing of Jesus. And just and there's many things in the Old Testament that are, that are pointing to Jesus. The Passover lamb, uh, and the, the temple, and all these things point to Jesus. And in Jesus, all these things find their fulfillment. And the writer of Hebrews says, well, you know, there's, there's two major ways that Melchizedek is, is pointing out to Jesus. Number one, his name, and Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 make a big deal of this. Melchizedek, he is the, the king of righteousness. He is the, the king of peace. Well, that was just for, for a time and place. But who is the ultimate king of peace? Who is the ultimate king of righteousness and justice? Well, we know from Isaiah 9, Isaiah 32, and, and different parts in the Old Testament, they're yearning for the Messiah to be uh, one who brings true righteousness and true justice and, and true lasting shalom. And sure enough, Jesus comes and he embodies that. So Melchizedek was this, this little bit, the little start of righteousness and peace, and Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Secondly, it's also genealogy as well, because uh, in the Old Testament, to be a priest, you had to descend from Aaron, and you had to be in the tribe of, of Levi. But here's Melchizedek just showing up out of nowhere, and he is, he's a priest, he doesn't appear to be from the tribe of, 
of uh, Levi. He's not a Levite. He's not even an Israelite. And so he's kind of this, this, this one of a kind, just, just out of nowhere. And that's what the Hebrews is saying too. Jesus is, uh, is from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the tribe of Levi. But he is in the order, he's in the style, he's in the way of Melchizedek. He just appears and, and not only is he king, but he's the high priest as well. Just like Melchizedek was back in the history. That's a, it's a fancy way of, of Jewish uh, preaching and teaching. It's uh, called Midrash. And uh, Jesus uh, uses that. The Apostle Paul uses that. There's a lot of it in, in his writings as well. And Hebrews is, is this Midrash, this, this look at all these characters in the Old Testament and, and, and what they mean for us today. Well, that's all well and good, but so what does that mean for us? It's interesting. Melchizedek is pointing to Jesus. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, this is what Hebrews is all about, right? Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verse 22. Jesus has become the guarantor, uh, the symbol, the, the one who says it's going to happen, of a better covenant. Now that there uh, has been many priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. He's king forever. He's the permanent priest as well, the one who's the, the go-between, the one who brings the Father to us and us to the Father. Therefore, he is able to save completely, not just temporarily or limited or just a few people. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. The true king, the high king, he's our great high priest. He's the guarantor of a better covenant. And so, friends, we need a, a rock-solid, supernatural security, don't we? One who can save, has saved, and will save us. Jesus is unique, like Melchizedek. He's point, Melchizedek is pointing to Jesus. Jesus not only saves us, but he secures our eternal our future as well. So, folks, in, in times of disruption and danger, and complete upset. When people share their, their lives with you and, and their difficulties that they're facing, and, and folks, they might not be as, as dramatic and major as the ones that the folks in, in uh, Nova Scotia are going through, but there's some real difficulties and real hard times. And so here's our opportunity, and this is my challenge. Folks, we need to share how Jesus has specifically been our protector and our comforter. It's like that scene while Melchizedek is talking about the Creator God. He's talking about all these things. And Abram has the opportunity to say, Oh yeah, it's Yahweh. I know Him. I have a relationship with Him. Let me tell you about Him. And so friends, difficulties, personal challenges, cultural moments of danger and stress, these are the times of opportunity when people are open and, and listening. I saw a sign the other day, I was driving past Safeway, and, on, and it said, we're all in this together. And I thought, yeah, this COVID-19 has, has, has been a great leveler, hasn't it? And there's, there's expressions of solidarity, right? When something happens in our culture, we want to reach out and we want to say, hey, listen, I, I see you, I hear you, I see you in your difficulty. We're all in this together, aren't we? And so we get the opportunity to share a little bit of Jesus. And whether it's your friends, your family, people at work, it's, it's an opportunity to say, hey, listen, Jesus has made an impact in my life through, through prayer, or I, I or read my Bible for comfort, or I sing worship songs when I'm, I'm feeling uh, disrupted. It's made a difference in my life. And just, just leave it there and see how people respond and see people, picking, uh, people pick up on it. I just want to leave you with a verse, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Jesus, our high priest, has secured our eternal future and our eternal security. And that's a message worth sharing. And so now we'll move into a time of communion, and we'll begin by singing, God, You're So Good.
Hebrews chapter 2, we have this wonderful picture of Jesus, our faithful high priest. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, But we do see Jesus, who's crowned with glory and honor, because he, he suffered and tasted death for everyone. And he wasn't just the, the faithful high priest. He himself was the sacrifice as well. And so he brings sons and daughters to glory. That's just a wonderful picture in Hebrews of Jesus, our faithful uh, go-between. He is our brother. He is the one who brings us to the Father. And so we want to remember that, too. We want to remember that uh, Jesus has accomplished for us what we could not do for ourselves by celebrating communion, by celebrating and remembering by the bread and the grape juice, remembering again what Jesus has done for us. And so the way we're going to do it this morning is um, hopefully you've gathered your, your supplies, your elements, and you have them in front of you now. And in just a moment, a slide is going to show on the screen, and the slide has a prayer on it. And what we would like to do this morning is have you or one person in your home read aloud the, the prayer that is on that slide. And so you know, we'll all be in our own homes and we're in the church foyer today, um, but we'll be unified by the fact that we are saying the same prayer, thanking Jesus for the sacrifice of his body and the, the shedding of his blood. And so um, just in the stillness of the next few moments, as the slide comes up, again, read it aloud, quietly take part of the bread, and then there'll be another slide with a prayer for the cup, and uh, you can do the same thing there.
Well, why don't we pray? Lord, we are doing this in a different kind of way. And we're maybe expressing a little bit of solidarity with some of our brothers and sisters who in different parts of the world do this in secret, share communion online, uh, do things just in a very, very different way. They're not able to publicly gather. So Lord, it's giving us a small taste, as it were, of the way that Christians throughout the ages and through time have responded to times of disruption and persecution and times of uh, just when their lives were split apart. They come, always come back to you, Jesus, the one who is our faithful high priest, the one who, through his sacrifice, through his broken body and shed blood, is able to secure for us this supernatural security, this eternal salvation, Lord, that we get to revel in and live in. Lord, as we share it um, together in this way, Lord, uh, there is no substitution for gathering, but certainly, Lord, it reminds us again that we are a body of believers, and Lord, that you have, you have done for us what we could not do for ourselves, and we thank you for that. And for this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining with us today online. Um, we sure wish we could see your faces and um, even give a hug to just say it's good to see you, but it is good to meet this way together. I wanna remind you that um, we are still up and running a lot of things at the church, and because of that, we are still hoping and praying for God's provision in terms of finances. And so um, you'll see a slide in just a moment that says, that or explains to you some different ways that you can give if you're not already set up for automated withdrawal. Um, you can contact the office for that. If you need to give sort of on a one-off basis, you can send something in the mail or you can um, e-transfer and the details are on the slide. So we just encourage you to ask the Lord what he would have you do in that situation, um, not out of compulsion, as the scripture says, but um, just out of the the uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit. And it's May, and so as we're moving out into this new chapter, God bless you this week. Bye.